Is it okay to skip church for our kids' soccer games? That's just one of the questions we'll be answering on today's edition of Core Christianity. Well, hi there. This is Bill Meyer along with Pastor Adriel Sanchez, and this is the radio program where we answer your questions about the Bible and the Christian life every day. You can call us with your question at 833-THE-CORE. That's 1-833-843-2673. You can also post your question on our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter accounts. You can watch us on YouTube, and you can always email us a question at questions at corechristianity.com. First up today, let's go to John calling from Missouri. John, what's your question for Adriel? I have a question about prayer. And uh, a few weeks ago or months ago, we were, had a, a Lord's Supper. And the pastor prayed uh, to the Father, prayed to the Son, and then he prayed to the Spirit. And I confronted him after the ceremony or service and asked him about the praying to the Spirit. And I, and he said, it's all right. But, but I've heard before in the past that on a radio program, they said, don't pray to the Spirit. Hmm. Um, I found in Jude, where in verse 20, it says, pray in the Spirit. I found another place in Galatians, I think it was, and Paul wrote, said, pray in the Spirit. So my question is, Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, to pray, but did he show them to pray to the Spirit? Hmm. John, thank you for that question. Um, and just for all the thought that you put into it, I love that you're you're searching the Scriptures. I love that you're having these conversations with, with your pastor, digging in. Um, I I would say it is perfectly fine to pray to the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Holy Trinity, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, one in essence, undivided. Um, so we can pray to the Father, we can pray to the Son, we could pray to the Holy Spirit. In fact, there was actually a controversy really early on in the church, um, and there was this, this great work that was produced out of that controversy written by a guy named Basil. Uh, he was one of the early church fathers, and it was this treatise on the Holy Spirit. And Part of um, the, the, the catalyst that got this treatise going was a debate about worshiping, essentially, the Holy Spirit, you know, giving glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit in, in our song and in our prayers. Um, now, while that's, while that's true, and I think that there's nothing wrong with praying to the Holy Spirit, ordinarily in Scripture, you do find that the, the pattern of prayer is praying to the Father and... Um, through Jesus Christ, our mediator, the Son, in the Spirit, praying always in the Holy Spirit, as, as you quoted there from Jude. Um, and so that, that is a, a helpful way to, to pray and also to remind us that we approach God's throne of grace because we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has made atonement for our sins and welcomed us into the family of God so we can come with confidence. Um, and so ordinarily, I think that's that's the pattern of prayer that we, we see and that we can follow, that we ought to follow. But there's nothing wrong with praying to and praising the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, I think that's something that we need to see more of in, in our churches, John. And part of the reason for that is because we, we often don't have that rich, robust, Trinitarian language in our worship services. And so we're not worshiping the Holy Trinity. And when we don't worship the Holy Trinity, God, as he's revealed himself to us in the scriptures, most of the time what we're left with is just speculating about the Holy Trinity. And that's what you find in a lot of evangelical churches is like, well, we, you know, we believe in God and he's, he's a Trinity and we're trying to figure out what that means. And we're coming up with all these illustrations and analogies to try to define it, if you will. But the, the Trinity is not so much uh, the God that we speculate about. It's the God that we adore as he's revealed himself to us in the Bible. And so we ought to pray and praise, pray to and praise the Holy Trinity. And so appreciate that that question and, and your uh, pastor, and may the Lord bless you and your church. Hmm. Hey, John, thanks so much for your question. Thanks for listening to Core Christianity. Some great questions lately. People really dig in, into God's Word, as John did. Have to appreciate that. Let's go to Alonzo in Euclid, Ohio. Alonzo, what's your question for Pastor Adriel? Uh, hello, Pastor. I was just, um, I have a question regarding a uh, belief held by the Jehovah Witness organization, and it's that 144,000 uh, mentioned in Revelation um, are the anointed class, and they take it as a literal number. And then they say the great multitude it, uh, or the great crowd is the the earthly class. So the 144 class go to heaven and the earthly class live on earth. I just want to hear your thoughts and um, 
and see what you think about that. Yeah, hey, thanks for the question, Alonzo. Um, I I think that it's just wrong. Um, so one, we have to understand when we're reading the book of Revelation, we're reading apocalyptic literature, uh, prophecy. And so oftentimes in the book of Revelation, you have numbers that are used symbolically. Um, and you see this throughout the book. I mean, earlier in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits of God. Well, there aren't seven holy spirits. Um, or Christ is depicted as this lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. And, 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 and so we have to understand the genre that we're reading um, in the scriptures if we're going to rightly interpret it. I remember when I was a newer believer uh, reading this this section of the book of Revelation and think, oh no, there's only going to be 144,000 people in heaven. I really better get to work so I can be a part of that list. And uh, and I think that that's, that's the, the sort of idea here. But it, what, what, what John in this vision is not saying is that there are only going to be 144,000 in heaven. He's looking at this number of per- perfection, if you will, the people of God, um, this fullness, this great multitude worshiping the Lord from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And if we were really going to take that literally, if, if Jehovah's Witnesses really believed that they were a part of the 144,000, I mean, you could, you could take that a little bit further and begin to ask questions like, well, um, are you a virgin? Uh, which tribe of Israel are you a part of or, or, or um, do you identify with, you know, Simeon, Levi, so on and so forth? It's just, it's just not consistent the way in which they understand this passage of Scripture. Um, and so uh, I would point them to some of the other resources that are out there that can help them, like our Revelation Bible study that we uh, came out with some time ago. And uh, maybe, Alonzo, if you stay on the line, we could we could send that to you. Uh, but appreciate your question, brother. Uh, I am concerned by uh, various um, cults that are out there that misunderstand the Scripture, um, that get the identity of Jesus Christ wrong, whether it's the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, uh, people who say, we believe the Bible but they twist the scriptures and misinterpret the Bible. We have to be on guard, brothers and sisters, because it happens all over the place. And so we need to know the word of God well. And uh, may God bless you as you continue to dig into the scriptures, Alonzo. Amen. Great uh, explanation uh, on that one, Adriel. Thanks so much. This is Core Christianity with Pastor Adriel Sanchez. If you listen to this program on a regular basis and you find it helpful, We want to ask you to prayerfully consider joining what we call our Inner Core. That's a group of people who support this program on a monthly basis. It's an offering or gift of $25 a month. And when you join the Inner Core, there are actually some special resources that we'll be sending you. And Adriel's going to tell you a bit about that. Yeah, brothers and sisters, um, what a joy it is for us to be able to do this every day. For me as a pastor, to be able to to have this opportunity to open up the scriptures with you, I am so grateful to the Lord. And if you have been blessed by, by the work that we do, by this broadcast, would you consider joining the Inner Core? Would you pray about it? Um, it's a monthly donation of $25 or more, and we send you this book, Core Christianity, written by uh, a friend of mine, a professor I had in seminary, Dr. Michael Horton, as well as some other uh, encouraging resources that you'll get throughout the month. And so, again, if you've been blessed by this broadcast, consider joining the Inner Core. All you have to do is go to our website at corechristianity.com forward slash inner core. That's one word, corechristianity.com forward slash inner core to learn more about joining that special group of people. And one of those resources that Adriel mentioned is a special video um, devotional that he sends out each month to our inner core members. So consider joining that today if you would. Well, let's uh, get to an email that came in from one of our listeners. This is from Tina, and she says, Is it a sin to worship by live streaming instead of in person when our teenager has a soccer game that necessitates being on the field by 1130 a.m. on Sundays? We live stream the service from 10 to 1110 from the parking lot of the field. According to an elder and our pastor, we should not attend soccer games on Sundays, and we should prioritize church only. I'm conflicted. As a parent, we do teach our kids the importance of God and worship. However, because of the pandemic and the lack of games for the past two seasons, their club teams are doing more Sunday games. What Mm. do you think? Yeah, this is a, a, a big question. I have a lot of thoughts on this. In fact, so many thoughts on this that I wrote an article some some years ago, actually now, uh, back in 2019 at corechristianity.com called, Is It a Sin to Miss Church? Uh, if you've ever had that question, go to corechristianity.com and, and type that in, Is It a Sin to Miss Church? Um, you know, uh, one, my kids, my kids are in soccer as well. In fact, we, we just signed them up. It's been a lot of fun. 
Um, but we want to help instill in them uh, a sense of the priority of the local church. So we, when whenever there's a game or if there's a game, we actually haven't had one scheduled yet on Sunday, but we've, we've committed to saying, look, we want our kids to know that the priority is worshiping with the people of God. Now, I realize that that's going to sound crazy to a lot of people. I think so many people today, we, we just kind of have a low view of the church, of what takes place when we gather together for worship. But we really, we really need to recover, uh, I think, a biblical understanding of what's happening when the people of God come together. Read uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. I mean, the author of the Hebrews says, when we gather together with God's people for worship, we're coming before the heavenly Jerusalem, before a myriad of saints and angels to hear the good news of the gospel, the, the blood of Jesus Christ, which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, the author of the Hebrews says. That's what we're doing. We're coming together um, with the church here on earth, with our brothers and sisters here, but we're, we're actually joining the great choir in heaven that is singing praises around the throne of God. Years ago, I sat down with, with a friend of mine who, who was my pastor at the time. I was an intern at this church, and he was a huge fan of the Chicago Bears, um, the, the NFL football team. And he and I were talking, we we're having one of our internship meetings, and we're going back and forth. And he, he said something to me that shocked me at the time. He said, Adriel, even if I had tickets to see the Bears play in the Super Bowl on a Sunday morning, I wouldn't go. And I thought, you know, you're crazy. When are the Bears ever going to make it to the Super Bowl? Uh, but but I, no, I really thought you're, you're crazy. Um, like, who would skip that opportunity? And I, I sort of laughed, and he looked at me, and he didn't laugh. He just had a straight face, and he said, uh, where would I rather be on earth than with God's people around God's throne singing God's praises. Now, if that's really what's taking place, if we're really gathering around the throne of God, the true and the living God, to receive the gifts that he gives to his people through his word, through the ordinances that Jesus instituted, well then, yeah. I mean, I could see why he, 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 he said it the way that he did. The problem that I had was I just didn't really believe that. And yet that's what the Bible teaches is happening when we gather together for worship. And so what I would say is, what, what I would encourage you with is, is this, recover that beautiful, robust picture of what's taking place when we come together as the people of God. Read Hebrews chapter 12 meditate upon it. Think about who it is that we're gathering before and meeting. Yeah, there's a lot of other things that we could do on a Sunday morning uh, recreationally, but God calls us to him up to the heavenly Mount Zion, up to the heavenly Jerusalem. The question is not, is God going to be there? The question is, are we going to show up when he calls us to worship him and so that's that's my um, that's my take on this. And I, I again, I know that uh, that could come off as as controversial. I know that a lot of people think, well, well, gosh, what's the big deal? It's just a soccer game here and there. But let me add one more thing because this is such an important uh, an important question. Um, we are helping our children to understand what they should prioritize in life as well. Ordinarily speaking, I mean, obviously, right, the salvation is a work of God's spirit, we know. Uh, but ordinarily speaking, our children are not going to be more committed to Jesus than we are. Um, this is, this is, you know, there's been a number of research that's been done. Uh, Christian Smith, he's a sociologist. He's, he's talked about this. He actually just wrote a, another book on this. Just the, the impact, the influence that parents have on their children and, and, and their faith and what they believe. Um, well, a part of that is building these habits into our own lives and prioritizing them and setting the example for them. If we treat church as this thing that we can just sort of set aside and, oh, I'm too tired or, oh, I want to go to a soccer game or I want to do this or do that, um, we're, 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 we're teaching our children something about corporate worship. Um, and, and we're teaching them something, frankly, that's, that's not biblical about corporate worship. What we want to do is teach them to prioritize it, to love it because of what's taking place when we gather together. And so we really appreciate this question. And as I said, check out that, that article over at corechristianity.com. Is it a sin to miss church? And let me ask you a follow-up to that, uh, Adriel. So in a situation like this, as I said, they are, uh, going, uh, do, doing online streaming of their worship service. What if 
their son made a commitment to this soccer league uh, prior to these ske- these games being scheduled on Sunday. So they, I know you would talk about the importance of following through on your commitments. Let's say this kid, uh, the coaches said, will you make a commitment to all of our weekend games? Then they switch it up on him and say, now we're having games on Sunday because of the pandemic. What do you do in a case like that? Yeah. Yeah. And it is important for us to follow through with our commitments. But I think that our our primary commitment is to the true and the living God. Uh, When we were baptized into Christ, we were we were, uh, you know, God placed his name upon us. He calls us to walk with him, to honor him. And God is the one who calls us to worship him to gather together with his people. And so I, I recognize, right, like the, the, there are conflicts here um, and there can be conflicts, but I would say that, that prior, the priority has to go to the commitment that we've made to the Lord. Um, and so, and, and, and again, are there other ways for us to, to recreate other days of the week? We have, we have seven other days of, of uh, the, the week, uh, six other days of the, my bad. Yeah. Um, and so there, there are six <laughs> other days of the week to, to, to have, a, you know, to go and play soccer and do those kinds of things. I, I would just say, man, um, committing first and foremost to prioritizing worship with the people of God is so important. And it's something that we need to recover in the church today. Mm, good counsel. This is Core Christianity with Pastor Adriel Sanchez. If you have a question for Adriel, you can always leave a voicemail. Here's our phone number. It's 833-THE-CORE. You can call 24 hours a day, 833-843-2673. Here's a question we came we came across, a voicemail from one of our listeners named Caleb. Hello, my name is Caleb, and my question was about Christophany, the Christ appearing in the Old Testament, and your thoughts on that. Uh, just curious if you could give me a call back. Thanks. Hey, Caleb, appreciate that question. Um, so these these pre-incarnate appearances of the Word, the eternal Son of the Father uh, in the Old Testament, where you have this sort of mysterious figure that presents himself to um, the, the people of God, the patriarchs, people in, in, in the story of God, who's identified with the Lord himself. In particular, I think of the angel of the Lord uh, throughout the scriptures appearing first in the book of Genesis, actually at first, uh, to uh, Hagar. She's uh, fleeing from Abraham and, and Sarah in Genesis chapter 16. Um, and, and I mean, if you're asking me, do I think that these are, are legitimate, that, that Christ really is manifesting himself in some way, that the word is really manifesting himself some way here in the Old Testament? I would say, I would say yes, this is um, really actually quite amazing when, when you think about it. The Lord coming to his people in this unique way, oftentimes intervening. Uh, to bring salvation or to bring judgment, to bring curse even. And so this is something that we see throughout uh, the Old Testament. And, 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 and certainly um, having a fuller understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity as God continued to, re- continued to reveal himself um, throughout his redemptive revelation in the Bible, we, we can make better sense of these um, instances where, where you have this figure like the angel of the Lord who's identified with the Lord himself appearing and even receives worship at times. Uh, really, really quite remarkable. Um, And so knowing what we know on the basis of all of God's revelation, I think we can look at those stories and say, wow, you know, like uh, Christ was very much at work throughout Scripture. Uh, The Word, the eternal Son of the Father, was very much at work throughout uh, redemptive history. And that's precisely what what the Bible teaches. Uh, You know, Peter says that the prophets had the Spirit of Christ in them as they were prophesying about the sufferings of Christ and the glories that uh, would be uh, later revealed. And so, um, it's one of the one of the things I think that testifies to the divine inspiration of of the Holy Bible, um, and it's just really amazing to to see. And so that's my my take on the Christophanies, and uh, thank you for that question. You're listening to Core Christianity with Pastor Adriel Sanchez. Let's get to another voicemail that we received from one of our listeners last week. Is getting in vitro a sin? Should we? As Christians get in vitro? Hey, uh, thank you for that question. It, this is a, a another just very complex question. Um, and so uh, first, let me say, no, it isn't necessarily a sin um, to 
do IVF in vitro fertilization. Uh, but there are a lot of practical things to consider um, if this is something that an individual is thinking about. If, if you're looking for uh, a, a book, a helpful book, um, on on questions like this that go goes a lot deeper, then I'm going to go here. It's a book by uh, Dr. David Van Drunen called Bioethics and the Kingdom of God. Um, and it, it's just a, a wonderful resource. And, and there's, a, I think, an entire chapter on IVF that basically, you know, unpacks the, the, the fact that, look, that we can, by God's common grace, give thanks for some of these medical advancements. But there are a lot of other things that we want to take into consideration. Oftentimes with, with IVF, you know, uh, people are, are taking and freezing um, multiple embryos that they don't, they don't ever plan on or intend on using. And so we have to be really careful that in whatever we're doing and how we're doing it, that we're also valuing life, um, which is which is a, a core um, tenet, if you will, of, of the ethics of the Christian faith. We, we're called to value life, to care for life, to care for the vulnerable. And so that's something that we have to uh, also... Um, that's something that we also have to uh, take into consideration. And so, no, it's not uh, outright sinful, but there are a lot of other things you're going to want to take into consideration as well as you as you go through this process. So thanks for that question. Hmm. Here's an email we received here at Core Christianity. This is from Rosemary. She says, in Samuel 12, 14, Samuel gives Israel a commandment to fear, serve, obey, and not rebel against the Lord. As we know, there's always a judgment connected to God's commands. My question is this, with everything that's going on in our world today, would it be a misinterpretation for Christians today to focus on fearing, serving, and obeying the Lord and not to rebel in order to seek God's favor? As I understand this, it's because of our acts and choices that we are at fault with God, and restoration is through us changing, not through us fighting our enemies. If we keep our focus on Christ Jesus and the hope of his coming, won't he help us purpose in our heart to endure unto the end? Hmm. Rosemary, the, the things that we see there in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, the call to fear the Lord, to serve him, to obey his voice, not to re- rebel against his law, not to rebel against any of his commandments, those are all things that we could take for ourselves. It's a great reminder for each of us. Um, we're called to fear the Lord. We're called to obey the Lord. Um, we also need to understand where we are there in the history of redemption. I mean, we're talking about God's people under the Old Covenant in particular who were called to do these things so that they might live long in the land, so that they wouldn't be cast out of the land. And uh, we know uh, through you know having the, the entire story that eventually they were cast out of the land for their idolatry and disobedience. We're not in the exact same situation um, as they were. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not called to do those things. We are called to do those things, but we're, we're, we're not expecting that if we do those things, God is going to bless our country in particular, that he's going to give us his covenant promises, his, his you know, the covenant blessings, those kinds of things. That, that, that's very old covenant. We as the church are called continually to do these things, to fear the Lord, to turn to the Lord, to repent of sin, um, to obey the commandment of the Lord, um, and and there is blessing in, involved with that, namely just the, the blessings of obedience, um, of a faithful walk with Jesus. We're all we're all called to that, but we have to be careful that we don't assume that if I do these things, then all of a sudden, you know, God is going to bless America or something like that. Um, no, this is how the church is a blessing to the rest of the whole world, and how through the, the ministry of the church and, and the proclamation of the gospel, ultimately, the gospel is spreading throughout the, the, the countries of this, this world. And so uh, really appreciate your, your question here. And I want to encourage you to, to take that, brothers and sisters, that, that encouragement there in 1 Samuel chapter 12 for, for yourself. Let's fear the Lord. Let's turn from our sins. Let's obey his word, ultimately, to believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Hey friends, thanks for watching that video. I trust that it was encouraging to you. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're looking for more great content coming from Core Christianity. And if you haven't done so yet, would you give this video a like? It's one of the ways that we can continue to get the word out. Uh, So like this video and subscribe to our channel for more content. May the Lord bless you.